Hi guys, in this video we will look at UV-Vis spectroscopy. On the first slide here I show a carrot uh, which is orange. Um, my handout is black and white here, likely as yours is if you printed it. You can see uh, the colored version uh, from the file that's posted on the Teams page. Uh, we'll talk about uh, ultimately why is a carrot orange? Uh, this is a, an example of a UV-Vis spectrometer. It's a very similar size to an IR uh, instrument. Okay. One of the first things we need to do is to review our electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, you hopefully saw this in GenChem and uh, perhaps and hopefully even in your high school chemistry courses. Um, this is set up on the left side is your uh, high energy in with gamma rays, x-rays, and on the right side microwave and then uh, radio waves. Uh, with high energy come is correlates with high frequency and of course with shorter wavelengths and in the lower energy uh, light is going to have lower frequency but it will have longer wavelength so need to know the relative positions of these. For example, which is high in energy, IR or microwave? And the answer would be IR. Uh, visible sits right between UV and IR. Um, with visible, you can remember Roy G. Biv uh, to actually know the colors of the visible. But Roy G. Biv is actually going to go this way. That is, the red is weaker in energy, lower in energy, all right? And the violet, or the blue, is the higher energy. Now, if you move out of the visible to the left here, again, going higher energy, you will move into, you go from violet to ultraviolet. If you go the other way, you'll go from red to infrared. So hopefully you sort of were, were aware of the of that moving in to either side of the visible. Okay, we can use different types of light for different types of uh, uh, analyses of organic molecules. You know, we use IR for IR spectroscopy. Uh, X rays are used for X ray crystallography. Uh, of course, x-rays are used for medical imaging. Uh, UV-Vis is a combined technique, which we'll be t we're talking about here. Uh, gamma rays are very high energy, very dangerous, uh, not used, to my knowledge, uh, for any analyses. On the low energy end, radio waves are actually used for NMR, which you will learn in Organic 2. Microwave is uh, not used much, as, uh, but it is used for studying rotation of molecules. Um, so it's a more of a specialized technique. Um, okay, we also need to know for ultraviolet, wavelengths are typically 200 to, 14, to 400 nanometers. All right nanometers, how many uh, meters is that? Or how many nanometers does it take to equal a meter? Okay, typically wavelength, uh, when you do UV-Vis, you talk about nanometers. If you remember IR, it's reciprocal centimeters. We do a reciprocal with IR. 
Okay, UV is 200 to 400 nanometers. The visible region is 400 to 800. Being longer wavelength because it's lower energy uh, to the right in this spectrum or graph. Okay, so make sure you know your UV vis ranges and the other just general uh, knowledge of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, here's an example of a UV vis spectrum of butadiene, or we could clarify this as 1, 3 butadiene. Uh, we have absor absorbance on this axis, okay? Arbitrary units uh, 0 to 1. And then we have wavelength plotted on this axis. And you will, first off, you'll see that it's quite a simple spectrum. With IR, we have many peaks. Also with IR, the peaks come down from the top. Okay. And with IR, it is an absorbance. Um, but the opposite absorbance is transmission, and we may uh, use that terminology as well. But with UV vis, the peaks come from the baseline at the bottom and go up. And as we go up, that is an absorbance. So we're absorbing light. And for butadiene, the wavelength of maximum absorbance, that is where maximum absorbance takes place at, is at, if we come down here, about right here. Now, there's no fine tick marks in this graph, uh, or this baseline, but it's known to be 217 nanometers. And the wavelength of maximum of absorbance is called the lambda max. With lambda being wavelength, wavelength of maximum absorbance, 217 nanometers for 1,3-butadiene. Um, now, note that we cut this off at 200, or it begins at 200. We can go back over here um, and note that uh, below 200 nanometers equals vacuum UV. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to say how far below, but once you move below 200 nanometers, vacuum UV and it's typical that we do not measure any absorbance in the vacuum UV. When we do a simple UV vis spectrum, that's because to see the absorbance in this region, you have to do the technique under a vacuum. That's because oxygen absorbs in the vacuum UV. And if you tried to show an absorbance here for your compound, it would be obscured by absorbance that's being um, shown due to oxygen absorbing. Okay, we're plotting absorbance. Um, and historically, to plot an absorbance here, we wanted to pull a vacuum and remove the oxygen. In the more simple instruments, we just do not absorb, uh, measure any absorbance here, and we begin at 200. So you can see that this compound actually probably absorbs, you know, some over here, above this baseline. Uh, we're just not plotting that. But the maximum absorbance is in the actual uh, above 200 at 217. Now note that the absorbance tails off, okay? So we have UV absorbance here. From here to, I don't know, it's kind of hard to see where it tails off to about right in here. 
but then we go kind of flat line and there's no absorbance now this stops okay this could go out to 800 but we have no visible absorbance all right for this molecule Um, it's zero. Uh, therefore, the compound is going to be colorless. We'll go ahead and state that. And we can also state that for a compound to be colored, okay, you see you find maybe a compound and it's it's green. That's kind of rare, but it could be. Um, for any compound to, to generate a color, it has to absorb in the visible. If a compound does not absorb in the visible, it will be colorless. We'll talk more about it. Okay, so why does a compound absorb UV light. That's sort of the similar question we ask, why does a compound absorb IR light? What's going on? What's the physics there um, for the absorption? And with IR, it was a bond stretching frequency that matched the incoming light frequency. And then there was lots of physics there and we could get an absorption and we can go to a higher level uh, a higher energy vibration or higher energy frequency uh, for the bond or molecule. In UV vis, we are exciting electrons. And it takes energy to excite them. And typically that energy is in the UV or vis region. Now, there are different types of electron excitations that can take place, largely because there's different types of electrons in a molecule. You can have sigma electrons, you can have pi electrons, or you can have lone pairs. Okay? Lone pairs equals non-bonding non electrons, right? Um... And that's sometimes just called N. Now this graph shows the different excitations, uh, relative energies. For example, this shows a electron being excited from a, a non-bonding electron being excited to a pi star orbital. Now, to understand where the electron is being excited to, you also have to have some understanding of molecular orbital theory. Okay? And how this theory leads to um, excited state orbitals. Okay? And the starred ones are uh, excited state orbitals. Also sometimes referred to as, uh, in some cases, anti-bonding orbitals. All right? I'm not going to go into a review of molecular orbital theory here, uh, but we do have in this theory uh, excited state orbitals, and that's where the electrons are being excited to. Uh, Lone pair electrons being excited, pi electrons being excited, okay. Uh, the lone pair electrons can be excited to different orbitals or different excited state orbitals. Important though is the energy that's needed. This is more energy than this, okay, if I can draw a straight line. All right, for these two here, more energy compared to this.
Thus, in terms of type of light, everything is quantized, okay? Um, what type of light would do this? Well, you need higher energy light, and thus you need um, shorter wavelength. All right. So shorter wavelength light would would promote this electron being excited to a sigma star orbital where comparatively or relatively longer wavelength light would do this excitation a lone pair electron to a pi star orbital. Uh, which of these transitions takes the most energy? Okay, here we were comparing these two. The most energy is this right here. So this is your highest energy transition or excitation. And this is going to require um, shortest wavelength. I'll call that lambda. All right. Shortest wave. Now, what's the shortest wavelength here? Well, you could say 200, but actually, we could go into the vacuum. That would be even shorter. This transition is usually vacuum UV. All right. Now, why does that take the most energy? Well, sigma and sigma bonds are strongest. Therefore, sigma electrons are going to be high, harder, more difficult to excite. All right. Now, which electrons are going to be easiest to excite? And that would be your non-bonding electrons because they're not held in a bond. Since they're easiest to excite, it's going to be lower energy. All right. And the lowest energy one here is, well, it's the first one. Uh, here I was comparing these two, but it's much easier to excite a lone pair electron than it is to excite a sigma electron. Um, Uh, here it says higher energy transitions, usually vacuum UV. Yeah, that's what we said sort of here. Lower energy transitions, uh, usually, yeah. Most of the time, in, above 200, it's going to be your pi and n uh, electrons being excited. And most of the time, your high energy transitions, which are going to usually be in the vacuum UV, are going to be sigma electrons. So hopefully that makes sense. Stronger bonds are more difficult to excite. Stronger electrons in stronger bonds. Okay, let's say that again. Electrons in stronger bonds tend to be more difficult to excite. That makes sense, yeah? Okay. Last thing we can say here is that the pi to pi star transition is usually the most intense. Now there's a difference between position, that is wavelength. We've been talking about different wavelengths here. All right. 
versus intensity at that wavelength. The pi to pi star tends to be an intense uh, absorbance peak. All right, I'm not going to try to explain why. Not sure if I can fully do that. We'll come back to that point though. All right. And uh, this is probably here a pi to pi star transition. Of course, this molecule does have pi electrons. Um, okay. Here's another actual spectrum, uh, a UV vis spectrum of an organic molecule. And here we have sort of a maximum absorbance here, here which is about what, 2, 240? Yeah, okay. Uh, that is ascribed to a pi to pi star transition. Okay, it's more intense. Over here we have this little, it's like a second transition because this doesn't just kind of tail off as the intensity decreases. It's like something else is going on here. And this is ascribed to a non-bonding to pi star transition. It's not as intense as a pi to pi star. Now also it is about uh, I don't know, about 310, 305, 310 nanometers. All right, that's your lambda max. Um, let's call this a secondary absorption. or absorption. All right, but does it make sense that the, our, our labeling this as an end of pi star at a lower energy wavelength, indeed that does make sense because non-bonding electrons are going to be easier to excite and so lower energy light um, led to this excitation. Okay, uh, this sort of tails off here. I'm not sure why it didn't go all the way down, but I'm assuming if it kind of kept going, it'd be kind of here. Um, this would be your visible, yeah, out to 800. And it looks like uh, no visible absorbance. And thus, the molecule is expected to be colorless. Now, if it's a liquid, it's going to be water, water colorless, like water or ethanol uh, solvent. If it's a solid, uh, solids are difficult to be, co to be colorless because of their crystalline nature. Um, and it would be white if solid. Because usually a solid is going to be reflective due to crystalline nature. Um, okay, but it wouldn't be any color. On the other hand, beta carotene, this molecule here, we know it's orange. Okay, like a carrot. Uh, here's the UV vis, UV vis spectrum, and we see the maximum absorbance here is here, which appears to be about here, and that looks to be what, about 430? It's actually known to be 440. Um, so there's our lambda max. And we see it shifted towards the right here, towards a longer wavelength. Uh, and 440 is actually maximum absorbance 
is actually in the visible region. Uh, we have a secondary absorbance here. Um, wonder what that is, because um, this is probably a pi to pi star. Usually your most intense. What could the secondary be? Because there's no lone pair electrons here. Whatever it is, it's easier than the pi to pi star because it's at a longer wavelength. I'm not sure. Because the it's is it a pi to sigma star? No, that's a longer transition. That takes more energy. That would be that would be at a longer, I mean at a shorter wavelength. A shorter wavelength is longer energy or higher energy. I'm not sure what that can be uh, ascribed to. But I wouldn't expect pi to... Okay. Maybe it's a sigma to pi star. Uh, also, this is probably generic and this, these, these energy, energies here can vary per compound. Okay. But to me it's not obvious what this secondary transition is, but, but most likely the most intense is the pi to pi star. Um, okay, in the, in the end the maximum absorbance is about 440. It's visible. Um, what color light is it absorbing at 440? Well, we can look at the color wheel. And this is where we need color, not black and white. I actually have the color wheel here. And 440 here is blue. Okay? So beta carotene is absorbing blue light. And it reflects what is not absorbed. And we can get that color from going across the color wheel through the middle and we see we end up with orange. And that's the color that beta carotene reflects. And that's why a carrot is orange, because it has a good amount of beta carotene in it. It also has other similar compounds that probably have similar uh, UV vis absorbance. Okay. Now, question is that we can ask why is the lambda max shifted towards longer wavelength in beta carotene as opposed to the molecule above, which was about 240? All right. Um, sometimes it's called a redshift towards longer wavelengths, redshift. Towards shorter wavelengths would be called a blue shift. Okay. Well, the reason it's shifted is because of all the conjugation. If you look at this, we have 11 double bonds conjugated. All right, if you count them up, uh, that is a polyene. All right. Now, it turns out that the energy gap between your HOMO and LUMO, okay, your pi to pi star, 
transition that is back over here. See, this, these things can vary. It's about to vary right now. The Pi to Pi star, this energy gap can vary depending on the molecule. And in particular, it's a little hard to see here. Uh, we got three compounds here. Actually, I don't, I'm not sure why the ethylene is this. Okay. Um, we go from ethylene, one one alkene, two alkenes conjugated, three alkenes conjugated, four alkenes conjugated. The more conjugation you have with your alkene system, the smaller the gap is between your homo and lumo. Okay? Uh, and typically the, the homo is the highest occupied molecular orbital and the electron is being excited to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Basically, it's the energy gap for the electron being excited. Um, and the more conjugation you have, the smaller that gap is, and thus the less energy it takes. And the less energy it takes to achieve that transition, we're talking about longer wavelength. Okay, so this is discussed here. And so, again, we can ask... Uh, why is beta carotene orange? Well, it's absorbing largely in the visible, okay? And it's absorbing blue light and thus reflecting orange. And the reason it absorbs in the visible, it's red shifted, uh, it's shifted to a longer wavelength, is because of all the conjugation. Okay, ultimately, conjugation increases the lambda max. We're not talking about intensity, we're talking about wavelength position, the position of maximum absorbance. All right. So let's see if we can answer this very straightforward question. Rank, the, rank in order from highest to lowest lambda max. Remember, increased conjugation leads to higher lambda max. Okay, very straightforward. Uh, highest to lowest, well you have three double bonds conjugated. That should be highest. We have two double bonds conjugated, that should be next. And then we have two double bonds, but they're not conjugated. And so that should be here. Highest, lowest. Question, which one of these is more likely to absorb in the visible? Well, that would be the one with the highest lambda max. Now, does it absorb in the visible? I kind of doubt it. Three double bonds, probably not enough conjugation to give a redshift that much into the visible. Eleven double bonds gets you into the visible, but about 440. Probably takes about six or seven double bonds to get you in the visible. Uh, but we really don't have to answer that question. Let's keep it relative. Okay, pretty straightforward there. Let's try one here. Which compound in each set will have the highest lambda max? You may remember these two compounds, transstilbene and the stilbene dibromide. You can pause the video and answer for both of these.
Okay, well this, this molecule has more conjugation. The benzene ring, the three pi bonds, okay, the pi system here is conjugated with the other pi system in the other ring. They're linked by conjugation uh, with this double bond here. And so you have p orbitals all the way through here conjugated. In this molecule, the two carbons are now sp3 once we brominated them. And there's no p orbital on those two carbons. And so now the two rings are isolated and there's not extended conjugation all the way through the molecule. More conjugation here, we expect a higher lambda max. about here? You may... these are actual Diels Alder products. Um, we didn't actually do this lab, but which of these molecules do you expect a higher lambda max? And if you look at it, this molecule has conjugation all the way through here, not counting the oxygen lone pairs conjugated. But here, after this reaction was done, there's no longer a p orbital here or here. And so the extended conjugation linking the two carbonyls via the alkene is no longer there. Again, I ignored the conjugation with the oxygen lone pairs because it's identical in both molecules. More conjugation, higher or longer lambda max. By the way, this product comes from a Diels Alder reaction where you react this cyclic diene with this alkene to get the six membered ring and the one carbon bridge. That is another Diels Alder reaction that we sometimes do in organic one. Uh, TLC, uh, it's black and white. Color, color picture here. Um, not much to say here other than you do use UV in the lab whenever you look at your TLC plates. And, um, now, not all compounds will show up on a, under UV light. They typically have to have some conjugation. Um, I won't uh, um, go into that, but you do use UV uh, to visualize your TLC plates. A um, couple of applications here. Indicators such as phenylphthalein, uh, which is colorless under acidic conditions, but under basic conditions it becomes colored, it's magenta. And the reason is a chemical reaction takes place. If you treat this with base, under basic conditions, the proton will be removed, and actually these electrons can move in here and kick off this oxygen. Um, but now, see here there's no p orbital there, but now there's a p orbital on this carbon and you have extended conjugation all through here. All three rings are conjugated via this carbon p orbital. Um, so increased conjugation gives a red shift into visible. Uh, into the visible absorbance. And so 
the molecule in this form will thus uh, be colored. Where here it's apparently no visible absorbance. Um, this here I want you to think about on your own. I'm not going to take time here in the video. We may look at it in class. It's an interesting sort of application or question. Uh, these two are actually um, EZ isomers. They have different lambda maxes. Why? And then try to answer the questions there. Um, lots of miscellaneous type questions that can be asked with UV vis. Uh, it's very broadly applicable to many things uh, uh, between physics and chemistry. Here's a couple of actual UV vis spectra that are laid on top of each other, which can be done. This compound is called a chalcone and it can be converted to an epoxide with MCPBA, remember that reaction, an alkene reaction. And the lambda max for the chalcone is here obviously, it looks like it's about 300 nanometers, but for the epoxide it's here. Okay. Um, so the question we could ask is, why is the lambda max for the chalcone more to the right or a longer wavelength? All right. Should be easier to answer, easy to answer. Um, and finally, we'll end with fluorescence. Fluorescence uh, comes from the re-emission of the energy after the electron is excited. Um, and so ultimately, the molecule can absorb light it, and absorbing light it takes on energy but it just doesn't hold that energy that energy can then come back out it can come back out in several different m mechanisms uh, and one mechanism is for it to come back out as light but very often the wavelength that's re-emitted from the molecule is not the same that the molecule absorbed very often the light that's re-emitted has a longer wavelength. Okay? It's weaker in energy. Now quinine, which is the molecule um, I believe that's on the uh, cover of your workbook, here is a UV, okay? This is the UV vis absorbance. And the lambda max is here. All right. This is the absorption axis. But this here is the re emission, which we call the fluorescence. It absorbs this wavelength of light and then re emits this wavelength of light. Now, this light wavelength of light is colored, it's in the visible. Okay?
Now, I, saw, I called this UV vis because that's just generically what we call it, but there's not actually much visible. And there's a little bit maybe here, okay? Mainly UV, mainly UV. So UV is absorbed and then colored light re-emitted. And that's a fascinating physical property of this molecule. Um, so if we shine UV light on it, it will absorb it and re-emit colored light. And we can actually see that uh, very easily uh, because quinine um, is in tonic water. And if you take tonic water and shine a UV light on it, it will glow, it will appear to glow, that's the terminology we use, blue. Okay. Now the maximum absorbance here is what? About 450. But we got to keep in mind that's the color that's being emitted, not reflected. And 450 is blue. It's larger the color. Now there's other colors here that's also emitted. But the main color is blue. Um, and so if you shine UV light on tonic water, it will emit bluish light. All right. I don't have a colored picture in my handout here, but I believe it's colored on the original file that I posted. Okay. In nature, sometimes... Uh, Animals or organisms uh, can contain molecules in them. Um, and sometimes uh, organisms can fluoresce. For example, if, a if an organism contained quinine, um, then it could fluoresce if UV light, if it was exposed to UV light. Now, of course, if you're outside in the sun, you are... Uh, going to be exposed to UV light and then you would appear colored. If you, I, I suppose if you sat some tonic water outside on a sunny day it may glow blue. Okay. Now I'm not sure what the organic molecule is that is in the uh, bioluminescent jellyfish but it comes down to some organic molecule um, uh, doing this. Or maybe it's multiple organic molecules that are fluorescing. Uh, again, you can take a look at the colored picture in the original handout. Okay. Uh, I'll end this here. Ultimately, let's boil it down to questions like this. Okay. Uh, or questions like this. All right, but I find the other the other aspects here very fascinating, and it's worth worth uh, either reviewing or sort of learning some of this. Uh, lots of applications.